All right, I bet you didn't realize how busy we were in IT. I'm Amanda Pritchard, and I'm a manager in the Office of Information Technology, and I want to welcome everyone to our IT forum today. I understand that this is a very busy time. I know that schedules are demanding and your attention is pulled in a thousand directions. So I just want you to know how much we all appreciate you making the time to be present and to listen to the updates and the information that we have to share with you today. Thank you so much for attending. Uh, you may be unfamiliar with the Teams live event, so before we start with our agenda and details, I want to go over a little bit of information on what the technology is behind this, just so that you're comfortable with your experience today uh, in our IT forum. So we'll go ahead and pull up a slide, and I'll share a little information just about Teams Live. Uh, it may be your first time attending one of these sessions, or you may have not attended in a while and just need a quick refresher. In a Teams Live event, your video and audio are not shared, so don't worry about having a bad hair day. Um, we won't be able to see or hear you. Um, we do want to be able to interact with you. That's very important to us behind the scenes here. We have a moderated Q&A chat, which you should be able to see at the top right banner of this event. There'll be an icon with a question mark, and if you click on that, it'll say um, ask a question. That's how you can communicate with us via chat. It is a moderated chat, so it's not going to appear to the entire audience. It will go back to our moderators. They'll read and review that, and then we'll be able to respond to you directly. So please don't hesitate to communicate with us. Um, send your feedback, ask your questions as we're presenting today. We want this to be interactive. We want you to engage with us, so please utilize that tool. We've gone ahead and we posted a couple of chat messages in that thread. So if you go over there, there's an option for you just to give it a quick thumbs up. That lets us know that you were able to see it and able to navigate to it. Um, so go ahead and, and give us that thumbs up. That way we know that our communication has been uh, enabled with you. If you would like to utilize closed captioning, that is also available, and you'll notice that in the bottom lower right-hand corner of your screen. You are able to activate that and turn that on. If you would like to do so, please feel free to do that. Uh, and then we also posted a link to the slide deck. If you want to follow along, if you want more information on what we're sharing, or if you want to be able to go back, you can do that. And 
special trick. If you didn't already know, in Teams Live, you're able to rewind and pause the video feed. So if there's anything that uh, pulls you away for a moment and you don't want to miss what we're discussing, you can simply hover over the video feed to select pause or rewind to catch up on any of our content today. OK, next, please. So I know I've already introduced myself and you are all aware I am not Frank Fegans. Um, I'm Amanda Pritchard. Frank was called away into a critical cabinet meeting this morning, so he asked for me to fill in on some of his updates for you and he sends his sincere apologies for not being able to join us first thing this morning. So I will try to do my best to uh, represent his information and share the stories um, of, of what we're doing on campus with you all today. Day. Okay, next please. The first thing uh, on our agenda was to talk a little bit about the IT Summit, which we held uh, this semester. And I think we have another little video that we'll be able to share with you all just so that you can see um, just so that you can see what we've been doing and a, a little bit more about that event and the impact that it had to campus. This is an event that we've had previously and we hadn't been able to do it because of COVID. So uh, we, we were brought it back this semester. It was a wonderful opportunity uh, to have everyone together. <laughs> Sounds like the video is coming. Just one second, we'll get it pulled up here. But it was a wonderful opportunity to, to bring, bring everybody together again. Um, for those discussions and uh, information on technology. So I'll go ahead, we'll share that video and we can do it split screen here so I can continue to talk to you. All right, we'll go ahead, I'll, uh, we'll mute that sound on the video. And I just wanted to explain to you a little bit about what you're seeing here in our quick recap of content from that uh, session. We brought together experts in the field, both from our own uh, department, as well as from the, the greater DFW Metroplex, just to talk about the, the technology and the issues that are on the forefront of all of our minds. We had a couple of large group keynote sessions so that we were able to speak to all of campus. And then we, in addition, we offered those smaller breakout room sessions so that we could get deeper in conversation and make those meaningful connections with each other in those discussions. They were very hands-on and it was held in the Davidson Gundy Alumni Center. So we wanna thank everybody who was able to join us and participate in those brainstorming sessions, uh, those discussions, because it, it was an opportunity that we've been missing for several years now. And it was amazing to be able to rejoin everyone there. It was also an opportunity. We had vendors come out, people that uh, we work with, companies that we work with regularly, representatives from those in a vendor fair. They were able to share information there on the resources they provide, the services, and, and just the uh, community that they give us with campus by being able to rely on the materials that they provide and their coverage for us. In addition to having um, all of these experts in the industry come out, it was an opportunity for our students to be able to volunteer. We had them um, bagging gifts, uh, doing door entry and name tags, uh, all of those things so that they could be able to support us um, with this venture. So this is just a quick thank you to all of our uh, sponsors. We were so appreciative of the, the wealth of information and the support that they provided uh, to us at this event. So I'll go ahead and share next just a little bit more on the uh, agenda of that event so that you can see the, the different sessions. I know you got to actually see it in the video, but we'll pull up some slides here uh, in just a second so that you can see what it looked like, um, a, a breakdown of the day as well. Perfect. 
Excellent. So this is a, a quick preview of uh, the different sessions that we offered. So you can see at a glance, we had a wealth of information, a lot of different details uh, regarding information technology uh, from from what the future holds for our campus, what are what are we moving towards? How do we always stay ahead of the game and ahead of the curve on um, our IT? We had great discussions too on um, the impact IT has just on campus in general for the success of our students, our researchers, our faculty and staff, um, and a special. Uh, plug that I, I wanted to just mention a new idea that we had not introduced in the past that we would love to continue to bring to campus was our inaugural women in technology panel. Um, women are, are very underrepresented in technology as a whole, and so we wanted to shed some light on that and, and our effort to be more inclusive and to embrace the diversity that our department offers. So we did have a panel just bringing up some of those issues and some of those discussion points. The afternoon was again filled with different tracks of information. So depending on what content you were wanting, what information you were after for the day, we had those segmented out and you could attend those different breakout sessions. Those allowed for that greater interaction. And um, I'm, I was just so impressed with the discussions and uh, the, the connections that were able to be made at that event. So the next uh, and final slide that I have for you all on Summit is uh, just a group to the group pictures. Just again, I know you saw a lot of this in the video, but just uh, the photos of the individuals and some of the individuals that were able to participate in that day. So we truly thank you for joining our event such as today and for coming to our in person. I know it demands a lot of additional time and effort to be at either. So thank you for uh, attending. Uh, so the today's agenda, so we're ready to kind of get into the meat of our details today. We wanted to bring to you the purpose of forum is to bring to you the, the latest and greatest information and updates on technology. Uh, digital transformation is a critical resource that we have on campus and provides a huge array of services to campus. And it's so many, I don't think that even the team could possibly name them all. Uh, to help gather and pull that content together, we've done some website updates and overhauls so that we're better able to serve you on campus. We're going to talk a little bit too about uh, Comet Text, a new opportunity to get some text messages out to, to students and get that information. Video sharing, this this type of world that we're in now videos are critical and so we'll talk about the changes that are made there they access control how we we manage your your identity and make sure that securities are provisioned and then i'm pretty sure everybody loves uh, having a strong and secure network that wi-fi and direct connect are important for our business so we'll share updates there and finally we're going to close with information on our supercomputing conference so next, I'd like to transition it over to uh, Scott Simpson, who's going to talk about those updates to uh, the website and share with you just how we've made improvements there. So Scott, welcome. Good morning. Thank you, Amanda. Let me go. Right. So Scott, while you're pulling that up, I had a quick question. Sure. Why does Santa use a GPS? OK, I give up. Why? <laughs> he doesn't want to be a lost clause. If it's oh, not oh, Alexa, oh. yep, that's good. <laughs> that's good. All right, let's uh, let's take a look at this uh, website that uh, Amanda was talking about. Uh, digital transformation. Um, our division of OIT is called digital transformation. This is something that was going on a little bit already, um, but our CIO Frank Figgins had the foresight to say, let's let's call it what it is. Uh, the teams that are helping the functional areas with digital transformation initiatives, um, let's let's call that section of OIT digital transformation, and we are tightly involved with. Um, we call them funky techs. We have functional technical people, people who are. Uh, 
who, who can translate things to our language. Some of our most fantastic end users um, really help us out in talking to the uh, academic areas, the business areas, and helping them transform their business processes from something that's kind of legacy or the old way of doing it into something that's the new way of doing it, um, which is what digital transformation is all about. We're really into digital transformation as a concept and as a way to help the university move ahead. Um, we're so into it. In fact, yesterday I was uh, sitting in on a digital transformation um, presentation for uh, the legal field, looking and seeing how they're doing digital transformation in their industry. We're really all about this. One of our problems was though, um, we have the people, like I said, that we're very involved with on a day-to-day, week-to-week basis, but then we would still bump into people around the campus who would say, I didn't even know you guys were doing this sort of stuff, or I didn't even know this kind of thing was possible on the campus. So we are looking at ways to make our services known. Um, we, we, we want the university to know what they have. Um, we want the university to ask us what we can help with. Um, and there's already a lot of things going on, but we still want to know more about what we can do for the university. So we reached out to our colleagues in client services here within OIT and uh, they said, well, you know what? Here's one reason they don't know what's going on. We don't have a lot of good information about your services on the website. So what you see in front of you is now a more streamlined, um, clear spoken, easy to read, easy to look at website for digital transformation. And I love the way that our peers helped us. Um, the information just flows down. Uh, one of the first things that you get um, when you mention digital transformation is what is that? Um, who is that? What do they do and, and how do I get a hold of them? So this uh, revamped website helps us out immensely with getting that information across in a again, a very easy to read streamlined format. At the very top, we do have some concepts that we about digital transformation that we borrowed from Educause. We even have a video from Educause and an article from Educause about digital transformation in higher education that you can link to and read there. We have some examples uh, in how we help students faculty, employees. These are not all of the things we do. This isn't an exhaustive list, um, but this is um, at least something to get you thinking. OK, well, if they're doing that for faculty right now and I'm a faculty person, what what can they help me with? What can they do to help me do my job better? And then we have our listing of departments, which answers the question about, well, OK, who who makes up digital transformation? We didn't really have this information very clear before. Um, and, and it's nice because you're not even completely invested. I, I know um, life in the first world here is very hard. If I click on this and it turns out it's not the team that I wanted to see, oh, I'm, I'm going to go to another web page and then I have to click the browser black back button. It's life is so hard. No, um, if you just click it, it gives you a little summation of what that team's about. And then if you like what you're seeing and you want to go in and see it, you can click there. We've got you. Um, and then after they know, after you find out who is doing the digital transformation with our uh, schools and administrative offices around campus, then one of the next things we get the question about is, OK, how? Um, how do I move ahead with an initiative that I think will help digitally transform the campus? Again, we've got you. Um, our peers developed a very, uh, like I said, this thing just flows. Our, our work system for our software development life cycle is uh, JIRA, and we have a link on here about how to initiate a ticket in JIRA. Um, we talk about our work process here a lot of times. The next question is how, how, do, how do you support campus? Um, if I put a ticket in, how does it move ahead? We've described it right here. Um, we have things that are production support requests where something is broken, um, something high priority involving finances or student information or health information. We have to act on it right now. That's our production support request. If it's something that uh, is already working, but we need it to work better or we need a new capability altogether, 
we've got you here with the new capability request. We talk about our system for getting work there. Let's scroll back up. I, I'm not going to go through all of the teams, but I do want to show you. I really like the way that uh, the website was done here, and I'll just show you a couple of teams so you can get a feel for the flow. Uh, student information systems. We, we, we do students first here at UT Dallas, so let's take a look at the student information systems page. Um, again, at the top of the page, everything just flows down. Who are they? What do they do? Right here in the green box, you have the summation of what, again, it's it's brief, but it gives you an idea of what this team does and how they help. Um, the next box talks about how they're governed, um, how the work is governed. Um, there is an Orion user group so that anything for the student information system, any kind of new development or anything that needs to be improved, um, goes before the Orion user group. There's there's actual governance where they talk about these initiatives and these requests and they decide how they're going to be done and in what order they're going to be done. Um, again, how to submit a work request ticket to this group. And then um, if you want to know more about what this group does and with a little uh, more granularity, uh, we have a listing of some of the services where student uh, areas where student information systems serves. And um, if you want to know more information and you want to dig down even deeper, like I said, the, the pages flow very nicely now. Um, you can click on it and it comes down and describes in more detail what each one of those services are. And we even have the frequently asked questions um, link at the bottom. Let's look at another couple of teams before I hand it back. Um, talk about a team that has uh, a broad reach around campus. Um, when you talk about identity data, every person on campus, student, faculty, staff, we all have a digital identity. Um, this team, <coughs> excuse me, uh, this team shows, look at every area that they're tied into here. And a lot of people don't even know that this team exists or, or don't appreciate that it's one group. Um, here are the services that they perform. Here's how to get a, a work request ticket into them. Some of the things they do. And then one other area that I'll show is the mobile applications team. This is one that's uh, very hot lately. Uh, everybody wants a mobile app for their event or some type of business process that they engage in. Uh, this talks about that team. And if you click on this link again, here's who they are and what they do. Here are some of the services uh, that they work on and how you can get work to them and more about the services that they provide. So I would invite you to browse our website, come to the digital transformation homepage. Uh, take a look at what we have, who we have, and what they can do for you. And let us know uh, how we can help you move forward in the digital transformation of your area and for the university. So I want to thank our peers for this site overhaul. It really does help us get our message out better. Um, it gives the preview of services. It gives an enhanced user experience. The layout, as you saw, is very consistent and streamlined. Uh, it's so much appreciation for our peers who helped us with this website overhaul. Next slide. Our next uh, person from OIT who's gonna who is part of digital transformation is uh, the director within digital transformation Ryan Myers who's going to talk a little bit about text message capabilities Ryan thank you Scott I'm really excited to be able to share this with you guys um, go to the next slide please so we've been working for a little while with our partners on a new service we're going to pilot this spring that we've affectionately started calling Comet Text. Uh, essentially what this is going to be is the ability to send text messages out to our students uh, through the Orion system. Uh, a little bit of background on how this came about. Um, we had some of our functional partners as Scott was just talking about come to us with a request to be able to send bulk messages to students with important reminders. 
And as we started looking at that and started getting some of those use cases kind of explained to us, we started hearing from other departments who had additional use cases. So as we started looking through all these things and seeing what the capabilities were, the biggest kind of roadblock we ran into initially was finding uh, a service provider to send out these messages. As we kept kind of doing our research, we found one that not only could do the, the messaging for us, but also had the hooks into the, the PeopleSoft system, which is the backbone of, of the Orion system. And so we, we established that partnership and started doing the work and we were able to kind of kick the development of this into high gear. And as a result, we've now got the, the technical solution essentially developed and we're going to start working on a pilot program this spring. Uh, as you can see on the slide, we're going to have essentially two modes that this process will work in. There's a one-to-one -one notification, and there's also a, a group texting, which is one to, to one text going out to many students. Uh, next slide, please. So here's a screenshot of what the the one-to-one -one text messaging looks like. Uh, it's, it looks like a very basic screen, but this is. Um, one of the favorite things I get to do, I get to brag on one of my developers. This is actually, there's a genius behind this simplicity because this is a standalone page and it, this is as straightforward as it looks like. You plug in a phone number, you plug in the text message, you hit send individual text and it works. And that's great. But what's really slick about this is we have the ability to actually embed this little page into other pages within the Orion system. An example of that, we're working on a project with um, the graduation help desk where they capture advising notes. If they want to be able to send a text reminder to a student as a result of that um, advising session to with to do lists or whatever, we can actually put this page within that component for them and they can send a text from there instead of having come someplace else to do it. So there's a lot of flexibility that this thing is going to offer for us. Uh, for the initial pilot rollout, uh, this page is going to be just a standalone page, just like you see here. So again, it'll be an opportunity for those uh, those departments to have kind of that one on one interaction with a student where they just want to send a quick reminder or maybe a recap of a conversation. Uh, they'll be able to do that using this page here. This next option is really what started the conversation in the first place. This is the ability to send messages in kind of in mass. It uses uh, the, the query engine within the PeopleSoft system to identify the students to receive a message. Um, essentially what you're seeing here is this C135 that you see on the screenshot here will give you a list of students and their phone numbers based on whatever criteria you tell it to, to do. Um, and then you plug in your message into the comment text message and hit the run button to actually send the message out. An example where this is going to be useful uh, our bursar office, it takes a lot of pride in making sure that students get their, their bills paid every semester so they don't have to drop students. And I know that group spends a lot of time sending out emails and phone calls, and it wouldn't surprise me to find out that they're going door to door, knocking on people's house doors and apartment doors to make sure they pay their bills. Well, this will give us the ability to uh, identify students who are coming close to the payment deadline, who maybe still have an outstanding balance, and send them a text saying, hey, you need to go into your student center and pay your fees. Uh, another example would be for our registrar's office right before registration opens up to let folks know that their registration appointments are available to view in the Orion Student Center. Uh, we can do a lot of things with this. We can include things like hyperlinks to to-do lists or to other information. We can include links that will actually take a student from their text message into their Orion Student Center once they log in. Uh, so there's a lot of capabilities built into this. Uh, next slide, please. So some things that will be a little bit familiar to the campus. We're reusing the 883-883 number. Uh, again, I talked about that partner at the very beginning that was that actually had some of the capabilities to work with the PeopleSoft system. Um, the same vendor actually was the one that uh, we used for the daily health check phone number. So we were able to actually reestablish that number. It saved a little bit of, of effort to get things spun up and it allowed us to test this thing a little more quickly. And so uh, if you block that number, I would kindly ask that you unblock it because this spring uh, you will start to see things come from that number again. It will not be asking anyone to do a daily health check, I promise. 
Uh, it will be just information and we'll, we'll be texting it with something along the lines of comment text or something that indicates an informational text that you want to take a look at. Um, we're also going to be working with those same functional partners to come up with an opt in capability for our students. We want students to actually request to be able to be a part of this system. We don't want to just start sending stuff out and assuming that just because we have a phone number for someone that they want to receive a text through this capability. We want students to actually say, yes, I'm interested in this. This will be helpful to me. Uh, let's see. Uh, one other thing to note is, let's see, we're working with uh, the Office of Communication on and those functional partners to come up with some guidelines around how we want to roll this out. Um, the, the trick to any kind of new communication method is you really want to make sure that the information is coming out is it's timely, it's relevant, and it's helpful. Uh, so when you have something that's as flexible as the system that we've built is, uh, the trick is if you open it up too, too quickly, then you worry about possibly spamming too many students. And so we want to make sure that we're putting some guidelines around when to use this, how frequently to use this, what kind of information should be out there. And so we're going to be working with the offices that quite frankly are much better at this than I am in terms of determining what communication should, should look like and how it should go out and what's been effective with our students. Um, we're also going to be working with um, students on doing surveys and kind of measuring how this thing is working for them. We want to get some information to see what's relevant to them. Do they just want basic information? Do they prefer to have hyperlinks in those those texts? Do they want more actionable things like a link to take them into their student center? All these are kinds of things that are going to be helpful to us to understand what's the best way to use this to make the most impact. And as we get those things figured out, uh, then we'll start working with those partners to figure out the best way to roll this out to larger communities over time. So this is going to be an iterative process and because of the way that again our development team built this with the flexibility it has a lot of capabilities to go in a lot of different directions so i'm really excited about what we're going to be able to do with this once we decide once once we kind of flesh those use cases out get that feedback and really take this thing to the next level and since we're on the topic of communication I'm very excited to be able to hand this over to Nurali Muhammad and back to Amanda to talk about some video sharing and hosting options. Thank you so much, Ryan. Yes, we're we're excited to talk about this too. I know for a lot of us, we've been storing and managing these videos for quite some time. All of our team's meetings, you have the option to record and back them up and have that content available uh, for classes as well. So Norelli and I were going to talk a little bit about just the um, importance of storing and managing those videos over time and a little bit of how it's changed. So Norelli, we've been hosting remote and virtual classes as well as remote and virtual work for a couple of years now. Um, what is the difference? I've heard both. I've heard classic stream and I've heard stream on SharePoint. Well, you want to tell us a little bit about the differences between the two and what the functions are behind those? Yeah, hi. First of all, I want to say hi. I'm excited to talk about this subject. Um, and uh, I think we should reword this title to say stream. Uh, mm -hmm. I call it stream uh, coffee with Amanda. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, let me give a quick background. Uh, so. Microsoft was looking for a solution to deliver video content and they came up with classic stream and this was a ground up solution they came up with. Uh, there was a separate solution to deliver the video content for uh, our end users. And then they realized that Microsoft determined that this is not the best way to deliver the video content. So they went back on the, to the drawing board and re um rewrote or rebuilt um what we call today is stream on sharepoint now if i call it new stream i get to put a dollar in this uh jar to collect lunch money okay i'm going to try not to say that uh stream on sharepoint and what that allowed them to do is build stream uh within 
their M365 tools, what we know as SharePoint and OneDrive. Um, and that made it a lot easier um, for sharing. So I'm not sure if you guys remember this. Uh, um, back in the day when you were trying to watch a video on classic stream, it would buffer and it'll give you a hard time. And at some certain point, you had to download the videos just to watch it, right? Uh, <clears throat> well, moving to this new solution, helped with that buffering issue, watching the video um, and sharing. So it made it a lot easier. Uh, the other part is the good news is that a year ago, uh, UTD flipped over to the stream on SharePoint side. So most actually all of us currently today, whenever we record our meetings, such as this one, which is being recorded, it is being saved on stream on SharePoint. Um, so that is already happening and we'll get through as we, you know, you and I talk more and more. We'll talk about some of the changes and features that are coming up. Uh, what are some of the changes? How are you are impacted? How you're not impacted and who is impacted? So um, I'm sure everyone's thinking about, OK, what does that mean? What are some of the changes? Why are the changes today? What is going on? Please help me get this confusion out of my head. Yes, absolutely. I know. Um, for me and my life and in technology, I feel like the one thing that is constant that you can always rely on is change, uh, especially in the technology world. We, yes. we, we thrive on change. So um, you may remember these. Let's see. Anybody remember these? Oh, this one's upside down. Which one's upside? This one. Right? There used to be different types of video storage and over time, the ways we have stored videos has changed, not just at UTD, but worldwide. Um, so just like that technology's changed, the technology that Microsoft is offering and providing has also changed. And because they can do it better through the newer system, Microsoft has made the decision to expire and put out to pasture the classic stream method. It's not something they're going to be managing or promoting anymore, which means we got to get off the old technology so that we can be relevant and secure in the newer technology. Um, because that's being expired, they've been working hard on the the stream for SharePoint. I didn't have to put a dollar in the pot. <laughs> um, that was a close one. Um, but they, they've been working and enhancing those options. So the upload and the share options in the stream for SharePoint, it has that same sharing options that you see across Microsoft products. So if you're sharing something um, as a Word doc, as PowerPoint, Excel, all of that, it has the same user interface and experience. So you're not having to do it differently. Whereas the classic stream had a very different method. So there was a little bit of a learning curve instead of having that consistent cross platform performance. Uh, it also has, Norelli mentioned that that faster rendering, right? There's, remember if you're, if these ever got stuck, do you remember the little meep, meep, having to wind it? I do, um, but it has a faster rendering, so you're not having to uh, wait and wait and check your time and see how long that video is going to take. It actually moves along very, very quickly. It also meets all of the compliances that we have uh, to ensure that our videos are accessible. So it has that transcription and captioning built into the new system and uh, cohesive security and access. You can also, my favorite thing, this is probably a favorite for our faculty members as well. If you have a video and you need to be able to share that with a class in Teams, you can share that video directly to that Teams channel and class very, very easily. It makes it so much faster for just sharing it, especially if you have multiple classes that you're sharing that content to. Um, it's it's much more uh, quickly and concise for you to be able to get that content out there. Um, so it's it's also easier to watch that video within stream instead of coming up as a small preview. You get a, a bigger preview with easier to use navigation. Um, so I've told you a lot about the benefits and I think you can probably tell we because we've 
played with it a lot. We're fairly sold on it, um, and I'm sold on how it can help benefit our campus making this shift. So I feel like the next natural question that's going to come to people's minds is it's a benefit, right? We want to move along with our technology into uh, newer technology and even newer, right? There's now it's just on streaming. So as we move along, next natural question is what have we done to let people know we've we're talking now about it, but what else is being done so that people know how to utilize this tool and leverage uh, the newer technology, Nirali? Yeah, great question. Um, so, as I mentioned earlier, UTD is already utilizing the stream on SharePoint. Um, so that is already happening for all of us, the so business as usual. Now, the question stands, what happens with classic stream on all the videos that are sitting there today, right? Um, so recently we sent an announcement to campus and we um, disabled, that's the first step we took, is disabled folks from uploading videos to classic stream. Uh, and not, why now? Now why not before a year ago or why not later? So as stream um, <laughs> What's that new? Stream for <laughs> SharePoint um, adds on more and more features. Some of the features that were missing that were they were we were still utilizing on classic side now are available on the streams uh, on SharePoint. So this is a great time to put a stop to all the videos going up to the classic so we can prepare us migrating them over. So and Microsoft, as you mentioned earlier, expiring the classic stream. And in a six, six months or about six months from now, they are also going to stop, um, you know, overall uh, any organization to upload videos to classic. So they're also moving towards that. So we wanted to uh, be ahead of the game, uh, control that timing and that um, and that time frame of how we're going to migrate over and take the time to do it beforehand. So that's step one. Now, the other part we've done is, um, I'm sure you've seen this, some of you have already seen this, is we had live uh, training that we do on uh, Tuesdays and one of the videos or the live training was on stream on SharePoint and that was done, um, I believe about a month ago or, or maybe less, but that was also done and that was recorded. So you can find that recording on our YouTube channel. So that's also available. And um, uh, as a team, we've been working on a lot of knowledge articles. There's tons and tons of uh, knowledge articles and there's quite a few on stream that we have also updated and the and the, uh, the links have been shared that you can take advantage of looking at. So those are available for you to take advantage of. And then of course we are here for any questions that you have uh, anytime and uh, we'll be there available to answer any questions you have. So uh, now again, this is this is happening, you know, slowly but surely, right? Uh, but I'm sure the question on people's mind is, okay, when is it happening? Is it already happening? Am I in the middle of this or is there more to come? Um, so as we move forward and we'll continue to talk about this, but you know, let's talk about uh, when is it actually happening? Yes, and great question. And also a question on when that we got in the chat is uh, when did I rob a museum to, to get these? <laughs> so yes, critical question, wanna address that first. It's actually my wedding video. Yes, I'm that old. Thank you for rubbing it in. Um, but yes, yeah, so we do still have, we linger on, right, to hold on to some of these new, these older technologies, uh, even while we're making room for the next. So when is a great question on this timing. Right now, we are running reports and data since we did uh, close off the uploads. We're now able to see everything that is stored in there and do a quick count. Okay, audience participation time. This is time for you to open up that Q&A chat because I want you all to submit your guesses and I'm going to come back to them in just a minute. So Q&A chat open. Are you ready? Okay, get ready. It's going to say type a question and you're really submitting your answer. I know it's a little confusing, but I want you to guess. Y'all, Take a moment and guess how many videos do you think 
we accumulated on Classic Stream for the couple of years that we used it. So if you can submit your guess on how many videos university-wide, just UT Dallas, guess how many videos we've accumulated over time? I wanna see those answers coming in the chat um, so that I can see what all you think we have to be to have to move. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, a little bit more about the win while you're answering that question as to how many videos, just how many have we accumulated over time. So migration is gonna take some time, moving the quantity of videos, just like letting go of some of our old things, it takes a little bit of time to make that transition, which is why we wanted to start now. So what we're doing is we're, we're piloting a couple of areas in our area um, in OIT, just to make sure the system runs smoothly, that our communication process to campus is gonna be the best as, as possible during this change. And we know it's a change, so there sometimes is a little bit of an interruption. Uh, so spring is really when we're gonna try to target those non-academic units and begin migrating their videos over to stream for SharePoint. So any of the, the old, old videos that you have stored over on Classic Stream, we're gonna move them over into that new system. So it'll take, we'll, we'll be notifying and be in communication with those areas as we start to make those moves, um, but we're primarily gonna do non-academic units. Then those academic units, those that are teaching, those are, that are using those links uh, for classes in the spring, we're waiting and we'll be moving those videos in the summer so that there's no interference with your classes or the coursework. Uh, we wanna minimize the impact as, as many ways as possible. And uh, I did get, I just wanna address really quick, we did get a quick uh, question in the chat. And does it mean that you can't do uh, videos in Teams meetings or that sort of thing? It is absolutely still available. There is no impact uh, there whatsoever. So just be rest assured, Teams meeting, it doesn't change. It's really just where we would store this on the shelf behind the scenes. So day-to-day -day business, it's business as usual, but where we put these on the shelf back behind the scenes is changing. That's the only impact. We've already been using this, this newer system for a year. So any Teams meetings you've done over this past year have automatically been going to this new system. So no panic, no concern there. We're just getting this really, the old, old videos and moving those along, okay? So I just wanna reassure of that, but you're, the, the process that you're doing with recording videos and Teams meetings in no way changes or makes any change at all uh, for that. The goal for our end of this migration of those old videos, moving them to the new storage shelf, right? Just a little, just a different shelf to put them on. Our plan is to do that by the end of uh, summer 2023. So uh, it'll take a little bit of time, but we want to do it and we want to do it right so that it doesn't interfere with your normal business processes. All right. So next I'm going to pull up our chats and see. <laughs> All right, y'all got a little guess happy, Nirali. We got some um, comedians. <laughs> we have some comedians out there. I, mercy, y'all. I'll read a couple of your answers, and then, Coral, if you'll just wait a second, I'll cue you, and I'll let Nirali share the numbers in just a minute. So some of the answers, 4 million. <laughs> slightly high, just a little bit. They're not all my videos. Just a tiny bit. Um, just a little high. Uh, 2,500. 10,000, good guess, over 1,000, 10,000, 30,000. Um, we've got uh, 7,000, <laughs> very specifically, 1,549. Thank you for <laughs> your precision on that. 9,000. That's 100,000. Wow. I mean, this, yeah, there's, okay, uh, 3,256, nice. Uh, 75,000, 29.832. <laughs> A little bit more. Um, I'm scrolling through. There's so many answers. 100,000, 6,484. Okay, we're going to get Nirali back on screen and we're going to share the answer with y'all of how many videos we actually accumulated at UT Dallas. So Amanda, by looking at this, <laughs> I just thought of another question we could have asked. How many VHS cassettes 
it would take to store all the videos that we have? We should ask that, that is question. a great question. Great question. I started that right now. Hey, I, I just asked that question. I don't have the answer, <laughs> but hey, the question is out there. <laughs> so 160,000. We have a little bit over 160,000 videos sitting there right now, which is awesome. I don't know if it's awesome or not, but we're definitely utilizing the system. <laughs> and over 35,000 gigabytes, that's 35 terabytes of storage that we, those 160,000 videos are taking. So imagine this is going to be part of our migration. Right, so we need to think about how we're going to migrate this over. Um, and I guess this is a good segue to talk about, uh, you know, about the uh, the project. What 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 can be done? Uh, what are some of the things that uh, uh, the community can help us? Right? How how can you how can you help? Any project that we do, it takes a village, right? Not just one area. But a lot of these big projects, it takes a village. So here we are. Uh, well, one of the things we can do is if there are videos that you have that you are not utilizing, they are no, no, no longer needed, uh, the one thing you can do is delete them. Just go ahead and review those videos. Um, you can delete them, get rid of those videos. Uh, the other thing you can do if you think that you're not utilizing it, but you need it for reference, you can download them and save them for later uh, for yourself. So locally you can download them. That's Definitely you can do that. Um, so that will absolutely help. So when we get ready to migrate, you're not migrating over the old videos. And what that does is now you accumulated the old data and to do the search and look for what you really need to look for, you have to go through all of that, right? So let's have a clean system when we come over to the, the stream side, uh, the <laughs> uh, stream on SharePoint. Uh, so that's one thing you can do. Uh, the other part is to be on a lookout. Um, this is, you know, uh, right after the, the winter break when we return, uh, we'll be in full gear of migration. So what does that mean? We will send out communication to UTD community, and we will also send out targeted communication to individual departments. Uh, there will be different needs. We will target the non-academic departments first, uh, and we'll have those, um, you know, department conversations, um, the timeline, and get more specific uh, as to how we're going to migrate over and what that looks like for you and what that impact, if there are any, what that looks like for you. So we'll send out those communication. We'll get you all the details. Uh, we'll hopefully remove even further confusion if there are any. Hopefully this conversation here today helped with removing some of that uh, confusion for you all. Uh, I was happy, Amanda, thank you for partnering up uh, for both of us to talk about this uh, and uh, and hopefully we answer some of the questions. I'm sure there's new questions that are coming up, but once we return from our break, um, we will we will have this conversation with everyone. But for this, for now, uh, Amanda and I will bow out, and I have the opportunity to introduce our new, our, our next um, presenter is Shivani Naren, and she's the director of IGA. I'm sure most of you already know her, and she's going to talk about role-based access. Thank you. Have a good day. Yeah, thank you, Nurali. And yes, not so new. Uh, good morning, everyone. And so now you are in your friendly neighborhood corner of identity governance and administration, IGA in short. Um, as you all know, the IGA program uh, at UTD and the team behind it is always there to support you in your access management needs as you advance the technology in your department, um, in your schools. Uh, you're already familiar with the single sign-on services. Uh, it has taken the guesswork out of uh, how to authenticate as you bring um, new web applications in your area. Um, just in the past five years, uh, we have gone from three applications on single sign-on to now close to 200 applications across campus. Uh, we are at a mark of 191. Uh, that'll quickly, um, you know, go over 200 in the first year of January itself. Um, and and so uh, single sign-on, what it does is it's uh, helping you increase the availability and um, at the same time bring security um, an effort that you don't have to worry about as you implement new applications. 
so we want uh, today I'd like you to get uh, familiar with another feature we want to bring in this area that will further enhance the availability and security of your applications and something you don't have to worry about in the future in inventing in your own space. Next slide, please. So the offering we are talking about is based on uh, a very fundamental principle of least privilege uh, that states a user account should have the exact access rights necessary to exe ex execute the roles and responsibilities, no more, no less. And um, to apply this uh, principle in your area for your web applications or your for IT resources. Um, there are three pieces to the puzzles as you see in the image here. Um, and, and the intersection of these uh, three informational pieces uh, where you see the cute uh, picture of our mascot is uh, what helps you establish establish least privilege in your area. So um, Let's go over the three uh, uh, pieces of the puzzle here. The first is uh, UTD policies and standards. Um, there is uh, no puzzle there, so to speak. Uh, these are very well defined. They are publicly available, but if there is any uh, support required to understand uh, what are the policies and standards to stay compliant, uh, for your applications um, uh, for UTD. Uh, we have support in the area of our compliance office, uh, our uh, registrar's office for student uh, data compliance. And then the overall our information security office that can help you in this here area as you determine um, the principle for your uh, applications. Um, the next piece of the information is the available tasks and functions. Uh, now, Nobody can better understand this for your application than you. You are familiar with what tasks and functions you want to provide your customers, uh, to, you, to the staff in your department. And, and so we come to the third uh, piece of the puzzle here, and this is what, where we want to help you uh, with some of the tools that are available in the IGA toolkit. User roles. Um, how, how do we determine user roles? Um, we interchangeably use that with affiliation. Every individual on the UTD campus is affiliated with UTD in one way or the other, um, sometimes multiple ways. Uh, we might be staff, we are taking courses, so we are a student as well. Um, we are just getting familiar with UTD, but we still start our affiliation with, as an applicant. We applied, uh, we got accepted, uh, now we are affiliated as an admitted student. So uh, individuals take different affiliation with, with our um, university and that uh, tags them with a role. Um, IGA helps provide that tag to the account of the user and, and we do this in very close collaboration uh, with our Office of Registrar, Enrollment Management in the student area and HR and payroll uh, for our administrative areas. Next slide please. So what are the roles that are available that can help determine you, uh, the what we call the birthright access? Uh, there are some basic roles that we have made available through the um, Identity Governance and Access uh, Program. Uh, in the administrative section, we have employee, staff, student employee, we have the former employee. We still uh, provide access for, for W-2. We have retiree, guest, contract, and grant. Um, as, as, as you look at these roles and as you see them listed in the academic area, I'll take a very simple use case that may apply to the applications that you're, you already have in your department. Uh, let's say we, you have an application um, that your staff, or the staff on, on campus should have access to um, a, stu a person who's purely in the role of a student, just uh, they are attending um, uh, a, a, a program in a school, should not have access to that application. Um, if this application is using single sign-on, you can easily apply these roles where you 
let a role of staff have access to your application, but at the same time, you can take advantage of the academic roles, look at them and provide a filter on if there is a person having an, a, a, a role of just student, do not allow access to the application. So while you increased the availability of your application, as soon as a, as a person gets the employee role, they get access to your application. You also took care of security, where if a person is just a, a student, then they don't um, get to access your application at the single sign-on layer itself when they're authenticating. So these are some of the basic roles that we are making available to you to um, as I said, enhance availability and security for your uh, applications. Uh, we will be going more granular in this area in the coming year. And as more roles are made available, um, I'll be bringing it uh, to um, platforms like OID Forum um, to help you um, again get more efficient in authorizing uh, uh, your applications. Next slide, please. So let's look at how you can uh, take advantage of these roles. Uh, the team is here to help you. Uh, if your application um, is using single sign-on, it's, if it's already using single sign-on, you can reach out to identity provider at udallas.edu. Um, we can help determine um, how you can use the filters on the roles. If there are new applications that you'd like to integrate, um, start thinking in that area of that you're not only requesting for the single sign-on services, what roles do you want to provide that service to for your application? Outside of SSO, um, please reach out to OIT Identity, MGMT at udallas.edu. Um, this is the um, distribution list for our IGA team, and uh, we can help you in various areas. Uh, if it's an IT resource, let's say your shared, shared mailbox, and you want to identify who all should get access to it, uh, we can provide services in that area as well. So hopefully this was helpful. Uh, please do let me know um, in the Q&A section uh, any feedback uh, on how we can improve to provide more services in this area um, or any other question you may have. And with that, I'll turn it over to Dan to share some uh, information on Network Refresh. Good morning, UTD. Um, yes, so uh, much like the past two years, we did the wireless upgrade. Now we're going to go concentrate on the wired um, network refresh. Um, what that means is we're going to be upgrading our current wired infrastructure, which consists of approximately 1,200 switches um, with some of the newest gear from Juniper over the next six, seven months. Um, so you'll be seeing emails and communications over the next six months from our team, letting you know that we're going to be in the building upgrading the wired infrastructure. Um, what this means is that we're going to be coordinating with your building liaisons um, and those respective parties to make sure that there is least amount of impact uh, across campus, um, but it's also going to provide you a provide the campus with a better environment for wired communications. Um, and that's going to be pretty much it. That's the update I have for the wired refresh. If you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer anything in the Q&A. Um, if not, I'll be followed by G. Good morning. Um, so Supercomputing 22 um, is an annual conference um, hosted by the IEEE and ACM. Um, it's a chance for people to get together, um, industry as well as academics, and share information. Um, it's a large international level scope conference. Um, and this year it was in November in Dallas, uh, which is very handy for UT Dallas. Um, so for this this conference, um, there it's a uh, some of the efforts related to it are are ongoing around around the course of the the, act of the year, um, leading up to a week of staging for this event, and then a week of setup, and then the actual event. 
Um, so there's quite a bit of effort that goes into uh, producing this conference every year, and it's, it's an opportunity for people that are into heavy computational research uh, to get together and learn from each other. It's a, it's a major undertaking. There are tutorials and workshops. There's three to four days of exhibition. Uh, there are booths from all of your favorite IT vendors, as well as many universities that are working in this space. Um, so we have this 30 by 30 foot booth this year. Um, and things went well. Um, we have what's called an NRE or a network research exhibition going with one of our research teams at UTD and with the conference where we had 400 gigabit per second networks running across the, the convention center floor as well as out to Ackerd. Ackerd is one of the major internet pops in the country. Uh, so we're able to move a lot of data around and do experiments over that network. Along the way, with the help of OTS, which is the Office of Telecommunication Services at UT System, uh, learn our ISP providers as well as the conference folks, we were able to build a 100 gigabit network path from UT Dallas down to Ackerd and then over to the Arlington Regional Data Center. And on either end of that, uh, one at UTD, we had 100 gigabit per second data transfer node and at ARDC, we had the same thing. And then we did testing between the two to see how much data we could move over that link. Um, so efforts like those are, are trying to evolve the state of where we're at today and where we'd like to be um, basically to make the research type stuff go better faster stronger higher um, next year is in uh, denver in november so this is an annual thing that we participate in uh, it gives us a lot of uh, recognition throughout the country. It's actually an international level conference. So you can see some of the outcomes here. Um, we're able to pass 50 gigabits per second worth of traffic over that 100 gigabit per second link. Uh, would have been better, but we didn't. We ran out of time to tune parts of the network. Um, UTD loaned uh, Learn what are called uh, optical transponders to build part of this network. And by that, we're developing this relationship where research type things can happen uh, in addition to uh, the regular use of the network. Uh, so we're, we're kind of furthering what we are able to do and how we're able to work together. Uh, it's important because if you don't have that, there's only, you can only grow as big as yourself um, unless you work with other, other folks and develop re these research partnerships. Uh, two things, two other outcomes that are very exciting to us. Um, we had a discussion with Sean Goodnight from Dell and uh, Brian Dietrich from Intel, and they gave us a donation of four brand new Intel based servers. Um, if, if you don't know, my the cyber infrastructure group at UT Dallas runs larger scale cluster computers for when the research for a researcher or a student grows outside the capability of a single machine. Our group builds really big computers, some with 800 nodes in them um, on that scale. Uh, so we're building a new one right now, and this donation of four servers, it doesn't sound like so much, uh, but I learned yesterday the dollar value of that donation <clears throat> is over $100,000. So by doing what we do there, um, the experiments that are going on and the the, the stuff there, there, it's a very select group. There are less than 10 folks that were operating at the level of UTD, uh, places like Caltech, uh, the Starlight uh, Research Facility, um, and a few others are doing these, you know, heavy duty computational experiments and demonstrations. Uh, we have research partners in Japan and we were working with them to pass traffic um, there for analysis. 
so it was really good that way. Um, we got this donation of servers, which will go into our newest clustered computer system and become available for anybody at UT Dallas to use uh, to get started in learning about uh, larger scale computation. Um, another outcome, uh, a group that, that builds this works here around to build this supercomputing conference. There's a lot that goes into it because they build one of the fastest, most performant networks in the world, uh, basically to use during that week during the conference. So I was configuring a router that's involved in this that can pass 3.5 terabits per second worth of bandwidth. When you think about it, um, our connections are 10 and 100, and yet here we're talking about 3.5 terabytes per second. So five 400 gig connections and 1600 gig connections on this router. It's a tremendous experience. It's a chance for us to learn and grow and operate at that level as well. Um, so we can compare and contrast what we're doing today and what we could be doing tomorrow, depending on what the research needs are. That gives us sort of this contemporary shared viewpoint across the entire country or world of what we should be doing. So it helps guide us and it helps us step outside of our local environment and see what other folks are doing. It's very important. So one other piece to it, um, there's another conference that we're involved with, which is the number one optical networking conference in the country. Uh, we work with one of our research collaborators to do that as well. Uh, and we've done really well at that over the last four years or so. And they're starting up a new program, very similar to supercomputing, but where the network gets driven off site and it's all about optical networking. And a lot of folks never get the chance to operate at that level or learn about that. So it's, it's just really exciting that that's going on at UT Dallas. And we were invited to participate for the next three years in sort of building this new program. Uh, very exciting, um, a very, very good outcome from the conference. So with that, uh, we have some video coming up soon. Uh, I can, if we hold for a second, I can describe some of this. The picture on the left is the OFC conference. The center upper picture here is uh, the supercomputing conference, I believe. Uh, on the left there, you see the students loading the truck. Uh, that's a 26 foot truck, not, not exactly easy to move stuff around with. Uh, lower center here, um, and that looks like OFC. And on the right, this is actually in downtown in the Acker facility. Uh, the rack on the left, there is an optical rotum that we added into the LEARN network to make all of this happen. Uh, this is only the second time I've been really been in that facility and allowed to go there. And they say, you know, a quarter to a third of the world's internet traffic goes through uh, Ackerd and Equinex downtown. So it was pretty cool. It was pretty cool. You know, got me out of the office and able to see what what it really takes to do this stuff. So fantastic type type of stuff there. Uh, let's go video. All right, just one second. I'll get that pulled up for us.
All right. Thank you all for attending today's IT Forum. That is a wrap for the content that we have to present to you. I hope it was helpful for you all to get a little insight into exactly how we work to impact campus. The presenters today spend a lot of their time and energy ensuring that we provide the best services possible to each and every one of you. So we ask that you take just a one minute of your time, if you would, to give us that feedback on, on how we did today. What content um, are we missing that maybe you would like to receive an update on or what really stood out to you? We're posting a link in the chat so you can access it there. You can scan the QR code or if you want to type in um, that direct link, you can navigate it to any one of those ways, but it really does help us for our planning and assessment to ensure that we're serving you to the best of our ability. If you need anything, remember we're here to help. Thanks again for attending.